Uh, one interesting example is Surah Al-Hadid. Um, and by the way, Sheikh Zaradani, who's a famous scholar in the Arab world, collects over 350 scientific phenomena in the Quran. Um, but I'm not going to give you 350. I'll give you one, two, three, four, five. And just point you in the direction when we talk about Quran and science, what it's, what's it referring to. So this ayah says, وَأَنزَلَ الْحَدِيدِ Surah so Al-Hadid is Surah number 57 of the Quran. And Allah uses the word, we sent down iron. We sent down iron. Now, the thing of it is, Allah speaks about creating lots of different things in the Quran. But for all of them, He uses a verb called khalaqa or to create. He created the heavens and the earth. He created life and death. He created, He created, He created. But when He speaks of iron, He didn't say He created it. He said, what did I say? He sent it down. He sent it down. And scholars of the past were grappling with this issue. Why? Because, you know, the words of God are very precise. This is our belief. So when someone would argue, what he sent, he sent it down. He meant he created it. No, if he meant he created it, he would have said, he created it. He didn't mean that. He meant specifically that he sent it down. Right? And so you find in this, in the last century, in the 20th century, geologists coming to certain agreements about the beginnings of the earth, one of them being that iron was not, is, not, uh, is not part of the original earth, it actually came to the earth in the form of meteors and was buried deep into the core of the earth. Right? So the word used, iron, we sent down iron, becomes a very accurate depiction of the reality of iron because it was sent down. Another example is in Surah Al-Furqan, that's Surah number 25, وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا سِرَاجًا وَقَمَرًا مُنِيرًا Allah speaks of things in the heavens and the earth that are at His disposal. تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ فِي السَّمَاءِ بُرُوجًا Blessed is the one who placed uh, in the sky stars. And then He says, وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا سِرَاجًا And in the sky He placed, for, particularly for us, a lamp. He calls the sun a lamp in this case, Siraj. Wa qamaram munira. The words qamaram munira are describing the moon. The word qamar means moon. But the word munir is the one that's really scientific, if you want to take it that way. The word munir means something given light, something illuminated. Not something that gives off light, but something that is lit up by something else. Like this room is munir, this room is lit up because of. The light. But the light itself is Siraj. So there's the source of light and the recipient of the light. When he spoke of the sun, he called it a lamp. When he spoke of the moon, he called it a, a moon that reflects light. So at a time when this is not a known phenomenon, Allah is speaking of the moon as a body in space that doesn't give off its own light. As I mean, nowadays, obviously it's reflecting the sun's light. But I mean, picture yourself. 1500 years ago saying that, it's not very obvious, looks like it's giving off its own light, right? But then it's the, the, the direct statement, وَقَمَرَ munira. This third one is a cross between linguistic and scientific. I'll just mention the linguistic aspect of this very quickly because it's not a big deal. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the only people surrounding him were people of either um, uh, you know, idol worshipping people, atheists, Christians and Jews. The Christians and Jews were the more knowledgeable people. The idol worshippers were not an intellectual people, they were Bedouins in the Arab society. Even the Christians and the Jews at the time believed that the earth was the center of the universe. Okay? And this ayah comes down and says that uh, the beginning of the ayah, this is Surah Yasin, Surah number 36, um, لَشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي لَهَا أَن تُدْرِكَ الْقَمَرِ وَلَلَّيْلُ سَابِقُ النَّهَارِ And then this part, وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ The sun does not rebel its orbit, that it may come before the moon, neither, neither does, and so that the day may be coming early, nor does the night come before the day, meaning they've got their appointed times. But in the beginning of the ayah, he's talking about light, the, 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 um, the moon and the sun keeping their order, not coming out of their orbits, and then he talks about night and day not transgressing. When it's time for night, it's night. When it's time for day, it's day, and they don't transgress each other. They keep their limits. So far, he's talking about the sun and the moon and the earth and time, right? 
But then he says, وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ And all of them, all of them meaning the earth, the moon, and the sun. Because these are the three objects mentioned in the ayah. All of them are floating in their own orbits. وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ All of them, falak means orbit. يَسْبَحُونَ To swim or to float. So all of them in their own orbits, they are floating. Now at the time, one belief was, the closer to scientific belief was, the sun is at the center of the universe. And yet Allah is going a step further at this time, 1500 years ago, and what's He saying? The earth has an orbit, the moon has an orbit, and the sun has an orbit. Right? Way ahead of its time. And this is the theme in scientific phenomena in the Qur'an. It's not talking about uh, something so amazing to you now, but it's something to wonder that how is such an accurate depiction being given of a only lately discovered scientific phenomenon or scientific phenomenon discovered much later to be mentioned in this text. And it's not something, again, this is not something that was boasted or talked about or, you know, um, as soon as, for example, in, the, in, in Europe, in, there were other discoveries, Galileo and things like that. These discoveries did not lead Muslim scholars to say, aha, the Qur'an's been saying this all along. Because it was like, oh yeah, we knew that. <laughs> the book says it already. It wasn't something, a, a big deal. And I'm saying that because the scientific is only a recent emphasis. We shouldn't go overboard with the scientific thing. I'm just mentioning some phenomena that are commonly talked about, but it's not necessarily something you constantly you know, uh, push. Then there's of course the famous ayah about the heavens and the earth, which is the Arabic expression for the universe, heavens and the earth. كَانَتَا <laughs> رَتْقًا the word ratqan in Arabic means something that is fused and inseparable. Fused and inseparable. The word ratq was used when a mother is carrying a child because the mother and the child are inseparable. And when she would start delivering, the other was, word was used, fataqa. Fataqa is the part, the time for her to start parting. Literally, her body is parting up and she's parting from her child. So the ayah says the heavens and the earth used to be fused and inseparable and then we caused them to come apart meaning there was the universe in the, in origin in original in its original form was a fused united body some sort of matter and then it became and spread out and then the words used later on it spread out far and wide so it's close to very close to uh, interestingly close to the big bang theory uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the beginning of the heavens and the earth. And of course from the biological perspective, there's the description of the embryo. I'm not going to go into that one. Because that's a, it's a nice PhD thesis. It's out from a professor, I think Mustafa Ahmed, um, who shows the correlation between the linguistic analysis of the ayah, the, the ayah that talks about the stages of the embryo versus modern science and how it, that's looked upon. But I'll give you one last one. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ and we made from water every living thing. The basis of life, water. 